Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. I am Heidi Binko. I'm the executive director and co-founder of the Just Transition Fund, and we are really excited to have you here today to talk about the Rural Partnership Program. Um, just very quickly, for those of you who are might be joining us this afternoon and aren't familiar with the JTF, uh, our mission is to create economic opportunity in distressed coal communities all around the country, and we're working in places that have experienced significant amount of economic distress that have his historically vulnerable, vulnerable and marginalized populations to advance economic solutions that are just inclusive and low carbon. So today, um, again, we're here to talk about the new potential rural partnership program, which would be a new federal program that would help rural regions, including tribal nations, build on their unique assets and realize their visions for inclusive community and economic development. The program, which is going to be, which would be housed at USDA, would provide multi-year flexible funding to support long-term community-driven rural development, and it will fund organizations to provide technical assistance and help build capacity. So right now, as we all know, through ARPA and through the infrastructure bill, there is a lot of federal dollars available. But we also know that just because the funding is there doesn't mean that communities can access it. There are key barriers and obstacles from insufficient local capacity to match requirements to, to um, eligibility requirements that skew against rural and prevent the people that need it the most, um, the, the, prevent them from accessing those funds. And so um, the uh, RPP, one of its primary goals is to try to address some of those barriers and provide equitable access and federal, to access federal funding to traditionally underserved rural regions. So it's a new potentially transformative model for USDA rural development that would be a huge win for all kinds of rural communities all across the country. So as most of you know, the problem of transitioning coal communities is one that hits rural areas the hardest. And among our work at the Just Transition Fund, we've realized that despite the potential of the RPP, it's not very well known yet among transitioning energy communities. So we're gonna address that. We're gonna start to address that in today's webinar. So today I'm really excited to have three experts with us, all of whom are part of the Reimagining Rural Assistant Network or RRAN. And they're gonna help us better understand the why behind the program and how it fills a gap, more context about what the program might do and how it might work. And we're also gonna hear from practitioners on the ground about what this program could do for transitioning, um, specifically transitioning rural coal communities and why it's potentially transformative. And if you all keep wondering why I keep saying potential, 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 it's because the RPP is actually not a program yet which Tony and Nathan are going to speak to. So you'll hear a little bit more about the status of the program in today's webinar too. Joining us today um, are Nathan Oley. Nathan is an internationally recognized expert in economic development. He is currently the new president and CEO of the International Economic Development Council. And before that, many of us knew him as the chief executive officer of the Rural Community Assistance Partnership or RCAP which is a, na a national nonprofit of nonprofit um, partners working to build capacity in rural, rural and tribal communities all around the country. Tony Pippa is joining us today. He's a senior fellow in the Center for Sustainable Development at the Brookings Institution. He launched and leads their Reimagining Federal Rural Policy Initiative, which seeks to modernize and transform US federal policy to ensure and enable equitable rural prosperity. That is not a small or tiny lift. So Tony, we're excited to hear from you today and we're so glad you're doing that work. Um, and, the, and also for those of you who don't know, Tony has years of experience working on economic development, both domestically and internationally. So it's really great for us to have his perspective today. And last, um, but perhaps, um, sorry, fellas, the person on the panelists that I'm most excited to hear from is Connie Stewart. And Connie is the executive director of initiatives for Cal Poly Humboldt. And she is the chief policy advisor of the California Center for Rural Policy, which is housed at Humboldt State University. She's worked, she worked for the California State Legislature, covering one of the largest rural districts, not only in California, but in the lower 48. She served as mayor of Artica, California, and she's won awards for her innovations to bring broadband to rural California communities. And Connie's gonna speak with us today about what this program means and how it can be used, how it could potentially be used by people um, on the ground in communities. So just a word on format before we get started. If you could please put your questions in the Q&A, 
There's a little uh, you know, Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Those are the questions that I and my, my fellow presenters will see, and we will be responding to those in the Q&A. If you all wanna chat with each other, we absolutely encourage that, and we just encourage you to drop messages in the chat. So to get started, um, I'm again, so excited to have um, with us today, Nathan. So Nathan, why don't I turn it over to you first? Well, thank you very much, Heidi. Uh, you have been an incredible partner in all of this work. And I wanna make sure that everyone on this call understands just how important the Just Transition Fund has been to this entire process behind the scenes. She and her team have been engaged in this from, from almost the very beginning and have been not only supportive of it, but an active member and participant in this work as well. And, and so Heidi, it's, it's an honor to be with you. We really appreciate the opportunity to talk about this program and certainly the, the kind of the wider scope of, of things happening in the rural development sector. But, but thank you for your, you and your team's commitment to this work. It's, it's really incredibly important. Uh, so as Heidi said, I am the new president and CEO of the International De Economic Development Council. In fact, so new that this is the very first time that I've ever been introduced uh, formally in this role. So Heidi, thank you for, for doing that, that, that first introduction uh, formally for me. Uh, I have been at the IDC for a month. Previous to that, I was at the Rural Community Assistance Partnership. The IDC is the world's largest economic development membership organization. And we are specifically focused on driving more equitable economic outcomes for communities of all sizes. That certainly includes rural and tribal communities. And I think you'll see over the coming years in a uh, continued and, and intentional focus on smaller and, and particularly distressed communities across not only the United States, but internationally. This conversation around the Rural Partnerships Program really stems almost five years ago in the initial stages. And, and as a result of the last cycle of the Farm Bill, so those of you who don't know what the Farm Bill is, it is the single largest authorizing legislation for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. It includes anything from nutrition programs and agriculture and conservation programs to rural development. Rural development is a small subset of the USDA focus, but quite frankly, uh, hits above its weight uh, in the work that it does and the impact that it makes in rural and tribal communities across the country. Historically, within the farm bill process, the rural development sector has not had a super strong voice compared to those in the agriculture or nutrition areas where they have a really both deep and long history of advocating for those programs. And so after the last cycle of the farm bill back in 2018, a small group of us got together and said, we've got to do something about this. We've got to figure out a way to not stay in our silos and only advocate for our specific programs within the farm bill, but really think collectively about how do we advocate uh, for a, a broader set of rural and, and tribal programs that are really going to make an impact, build capacity in communities, and ensure that the investments that are being made are done both with the most strategic intent, but also ensuring that we're engaging communities all across the spectrum in rural and tribal areas and ensuring that those, those distressed and smallest communities, quite frankly, have a seat at the table in those conversations. As a part of that conversation, we started to evolve and, and figure out how, how might we collectively come together to think about some of these programs? How might we collectively advocate and educate uh, on these programs? And how do we get folks that aren't a part of this conversation typically to the table? So the Reimagine Rural Assistance Network, and I gotta give Tony almost all the credit for, for really pulling this group together, is a really eclectic group of folks that are coming together. It is anyone from practitioners and researchers to technical assistance providers, to advocates, to organizers. And it is uh, a, a who's who and almost a little bit of a land of the misfit toys uh, of folks that are coming together that are really passionate about this work. And it has been, for me, maybe the most impactful group that I've been a part of over the last three years. It is a group that is committed to this work, they're passionate about this work, but they're also compassionate about this work. And they, they understand that not everyone can play in the sandbox at all times, but that we want to make sure that sandbox is as big as possible, allow people to come in and participate wherever they can, and also to be able to take their hat off in those conversations and to understand that, yes, it may have a positive impact on your specific organization, and it may not. But if we collectively come together to talk about these issues and think about programs and funding that are going to have a positive impact, in the end, it's going to help all of us, our organizations, and more importantly, our communities. And so it's been for me a, a joy to be a part of this group. Connie and Tony are, are a huge part of that group and I'm excited for them to walk into the Rural Partnerships Program and how it might actually make a difference on the ground. 
But I also want to say this on the front end. To me, and I've been working in this field for a long time, the Rural Partnerships Program, if we can get it uh, passed and if we can get it funded, to me, could be the single most transformative opportunity for rural and tribal communities in decades. It is one of those programs that hits at the core issues in rural and tribal communities, but also will hopefully provide capacity for those communities to accelerate other opportunities, whether that's economic development related, infrastructure related. The, the hope and focus of this is to build capacity so that all those other programs within rural development and quite frankly, across the federal family can be accelerated because you'll have more communities engaging, more communities understanding what those opportunities are, and definitely more communities that can be more competitive in accessing these funds and these programs. And so to me, this program is the program that if anyone is going to spend any time or focus over the coming three to six months, maybe even a year, focused on some kind of federal policy issue, this is one of those things that has to be at the very top of your list. So I'm excited uh, to talk with all of you today to be a part of this group, but also to bring you into the fold to help us uh, advocate and educate on this program and the opportunity and hopefully obviously get it, get it to the finish line. With that, I'm going to hand it to Tony, who can walk through both some research that, that they've done at Brookings that led to some of these conversations for the Rural Partnership Program, but also obviously to walk through the program itself. Thanks, Nathan. Thanks for that, uh, that context. And uh, I'm going to share my screen here. Let me see if I can do that successfully. Everybody seeing it? Seeing it? Okay, good. Um, so thanks very much. And that's, that was great context setting, Nathan. Um, and I'll get into the details of what is the Rural Partnership Program? What constitutes it? But before I do that, I just want to say, what is the context in which it's coming out of? And this is a chart that is basically maps the entire array of programs for economic and community development that's available to rural communities. And you can see that it's a pretty fragmented, uh, sometimes redundant, sometimes incoherent uh, chart. On the left are the, the agencies and departments within the US government from which money uh, emanates. Uh, in the middle are the purposes for which they're supposed to go toward. And on the right are, is the originating legislation. And for most communities, um, navigating this, identifying what might make sense for them to try to access the resources of, and then being able to go through the process and actually capture some of those resources is a daunting task um, indeed. And in fact, many of these programs were created in a, for a different economy or for a particular purpose that really doesn't match very well up with the needs that rural and tribal communities have today, especially given a lot of the shifts that we've encountered uh, in the national and global economy over the last two decades, and specifically even now um, with what's happened uh, coming out of COVID. But with things like uh, facing, facing things like climate change, um, the digitalization of a lot of uh, both uh, work tasks as well as industry. This makes it very difficult actually to sort of find and package together the kinds of resources uh, that, that would enable uh, rural and tribal communities to both strengthen their resilience and put their plans in place uh, to be able to move forward. So that's kind of the context in which policymakers started thinking about um, why a new program. We've got a ton of programs out there, a ton of, uh, a ton of programs and, and a lot of money. Um, so why do we need something new? A, a big part of it is the inflexibility of the money that's already available. Um, the way that this money actually does not get directly to communities, but often is going through different levels to try to get to communities. And even the type of money that it is, um, let me see for something this is going forward. There we go. Um, a lot of the money that's actually available, and Nathan you know, mentioned the Farm Bill and USDA Rural Development, actually a lot of that money is financing. So it's a debt instrument in some way, a loan or a loan guarantee. So it's actually not a grant. And getting the money for people, for strengthening your organizational development, for um, creating collaboration, uh, for maintaining those kind of efforts over a long period of time, for doing the planning and uh, the, the things that are necessary to put grants together. 
a lot of that kind of money, support for those kinds of things is actually missing from that large chart and this portfolio of dollars and how it currently exists. Um, and you can see it actually, this is, this is some, just some top lines out of research that's been done and trying to evaluate how much rural areas are able to access current federal funding. And you can see that uh, um, in some of the analysis that's done that it's actually quite difficult, especially for low capacity communities to be able to access the money, even when there's specifically a commitment to get that to them. So for example, USDA Rural Development um, made a commitment to get 10% of its funds to persistent poverty communities. And even when it did so, it was not able to award those full 10% because of insufficient applications. So insufficient demand on, on some respect coming from communities, but also the inability for potential recipients just to navigate the process and to service the debt and to meet all the program requirements um, that's put out. Um, and match requirements are a big are a big part of this. There's not very much philanthropy, as Heidi well knows, and we've we, you know she's also um, you know mentioned a little bit of the work that I did in philanthropy in 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 uh, in the rural South. There is not a proportionate amount of philanthropy actually at the national level that's proportionate to be directed to uh, the amount of people who live in rural communities. And so meeting match requirements just from the very beginning is a challenge uh, for a lot of these programs. Um, and Frank, and, and some of them because they're based on per capita numbers also just sort of disadvantage less densely populated places from the very beginning. Um, so in, in conversations with policymakers, some of the work that we've done at RAN, as Nathan was describing, is to say, look, what we really need are resources to get to local communities who have a vision for solving their own local problems, but don't have the resources to build, the, to build their capacity, their local institutions and their local leadership and, and invest in the human capital uh, necessary to make this happen. Um, and there's a lot of inflexibility in the federal dollars that are available right now. Um, not only is it inflexible, but a lot of it's financing, and frankly, a lot of it's short term. It's for a particular thing. It might be a particular piece of physical infrastructure or um, just a particular segment of a program that a community might want to package together with a bunch of different things. And so this is the context in which, in, with, which it, within which the Rural Partnership Program was um, uh, conceptualized and, and developed. Now, what would be the Rural Partnership Program? Uh, so first off, this, is a, this was a proposal. Um, it was part of the uh, Build Back Better Act. Um, uh, the Build Back Better Act that was being worked on in the Senate, it was a uh, billion dollars. I'll, I'll show you a little bit of the evolution of the program uh, on the next slide. But it's basically a set, uh, two, two major portions to the Rural Partnership Program. One is a set of flexible, multi-year, substantial grants um, that would go to rural collaborations directly to those communities, not go through the states and have the states to decide, but it would go directly to rural communities. Um, it would target higher need rural communities. So there would be a preference for lower income and, and uh, lower capacity. Collaboratives could include a wide range of organizations, local government, nonprofits, philanthropic organizations, higher educational institutions. Um, there would be a matching requirement at 25%, but that could be waived. And interestingly, money that comes through the rural develop the rural prosperity development grants could actually be used as a match for other federal programs to access and unlock other uh, other resources uh, as nathan suggested you know what's very difficult uh, is to access those resources sometimes um, and there would be an amount out of the 870 million that's apportioned to each state based on rurality and uh, and income uh, and and income uh, justification, but it would actually not be given to the state. It would it would just actually say this is the amount of money we're going to spend in that particular state. Uh, alongside those multi-year flexible use grants. 
would be a set of grants up to 97 million that would actually fund national and regional intermediary organizations that can work directly with those local collaboratives to build their capacity and offer technical, technical assistance. Um, and that eligibility would include nonprofits and higher educational institutions. Now, those particular institutions I think we may have lost Tony for a minute. I think we just did, yes. Um, Tony, if you can hear us, maybe turn off your video. Um, your your internet seems was, to be a little bit shaky. Oh, there he uh, is, are you back? Are you there? Yeah, you're back. You know what, we we lost you for a minute. You froze ah, for a bit. So uh, so okay. maybe just go back, a, you know, a, just a, a few sentences ago. Um, you, I think the last thing you, you were, were just the last talking. Thing we heard you were talking about the first bullet under the Rural Prosperity Innovation Grants about funding for people uh, to, to do capacity and TA. Yeah. So yeah, the, the, Thanks, the 97 million would go to capacity and TA and that eligibility would include nonprofits and higher educational institutions. Those institutions would have to put forward a 20% match to be able to access that money. Uh, and then there's money for, um, there's money then for USDA RD since this would be a new program for them uh, to be able to administer the program and, and put it into place within USDA rural development. Um, so this started as an idea in the American Jobs Plan in March 2021 that the president put forward and was included in the budget request in 21. Um, then uh, when the House originally started with the Build Back Better reconciliation proposal, um, it went into that, it, it was passed by the House at $4 billion, and then was uh, a part of the proposal that the Senate was uh, considering at $1 billion. Um, so there's a question mark as to what might happen with portions of the Build Back Better plan uh, right now. This is really focused on and was uh, positioned as uh, a way to both create jobs, as well as provide resources to strengthen resilience or, uh, around climate change. Um, so there's a potential coming, whatever conversations might happen on the Hill now uh, about this carrying forward out of the, the Build Back Better Act. But I also think to Nathan's point, um, the next farm bill is going to be in 2023. And I think you've seen both some champions on the Hill and within the administration think that this is the kind of transformative uh, program that we need for rural America and would want to see something like this continue to go forward and be a part of uh, the 2023 Farm Bill and, and look for authorization there. Um, and I think I'll just stop it there and and because I want to hear from Connie what this would actually mean in implementation uh, and, and how it might be different than uh, with some of the obstacles and, and things that uh, she and others encounter when they're trying to access federal funds. Well, thank you both. Uh, my goodness, that, that, those are, these are my buddies. I can hang out with them every day. And, you know, it, they're hard acts to follow. But, um, you know, I just want to give a perspective from the ground. You know, I am. Um, I graduated from college about 34 years ago, and I decided to stay in my college community and eventually made my way back to campus. But my job is community facing, right? I was actually paid by the community to work at the university. I'm not a faculty member. Um, I'm, a, I'm a political animal um, to help um, elevate uh, concerns throughout the region. And our region has about 14, uh, federally qualified tribes right around the university that we work very closely with. Um, the issues I work on are, you know, broadband, healthcare, housing and land use, energy uh, transition, youth and workforce issues. Those issues have not changed in 20 years. And what my community wants to do around those issues hasn't changed in 20 years. So why am I responding to every grant proposal as if it's a new idea? you know, or a new thing. What I need is federal partners that understand on the ground where my community wants to be and aren't asking me to jump through a bunch of hoops or be socially engineered 
uh, with the latest idea of, you know, collective this or whatever that, who are just going to help our community get our vision together. And so, you know, uh, you know, having them understand that communities don't necessarily have the capacity or the help um, to put together that vision in a coherent way that can bring resources in to make it happen, um, you know, and allow us to hire intermediaries who can make us, uh, who, can, who can make the financial case for why we're worth the investment. Um, you know, is critical. And I think that's an important piece here with, um, with the intermediary piece, but not somebody else's intermediary, a community supported intermediary. So that's one of the things that, you know, we, we've been trying to push is don't just bring people into our community who will tell us what to do. You know, we know in our communities what needs to get done here. Um, you know, I spend about eight, I have two grant writers I've hired since uh, the Biden administration. All they do all day is write grants, right? Um, it, all they do is meet with community members and try to write grants. And they've written a couple of the Build Back Better grants. We haven't gotten any of them, right? They're, because there's so much need out there right now. But what we're trying to do is just continue to elevate our vision. And what we don't need is to have to switch or pivot to another vision. So when I talk about broadband, I, I know and have not changed my position on the fiber middle mile builds I need <laughs> in my community. I've been saying the same builds for 2000, since 2009, right? I need a way to get those done. I need help with permitting. I need help with everything. But one of the things right now is, and I can, I can share with you the list of how many different grants are out there. My community does not have the capacity to even match which fund we should be going after or what is the best part or which agency should I go? Um, so we need, we need a program that's thinking from the ground up, not, hi, we just created a program and if your community matches this, please fill out this arduous application. <laughs> uh, we, we, need, we need partners that understand our region and are on the ground. And so that's what we're trying to build here is something where we're not coming in and saying, okay, um, put on your lipstick and um, welcome to the beauty pageant. <laughs> but, but something that will, some, you know, some partnership with the federal government where they will care about us when it's not just an election year. Um, I, you know, I want to I, I want to be uh, rather than just ramble because I could ramble. I'm on the ground. I'm frustrated. You know, there's all this money flowing around and I don't even know where to go or what to get. And I know we're coming at you and saying, well, you know, we're, we're advocating for a different pot of money, but we're advocating for a different pot of money that will do different things that will be more responsive to our needs rather than us having to try to thread our way through the existing uh, Tony slide, which you know, still every time I see it blows my mind. Um, so, so please put some questions in the chat so we can answer them. Can I, can I add Heidi, anything? Or, Heidi and Nathan, I know you probably have questions too. No, so, go ahead, Nathan, and then I'll, I'll, add, I'll assume moderator responsibilities afterward. Go for it, please. I just want to add one thing <laughs> that Lakani just touched on, and that is, you know, she, she referenced, you know, going after the same pots of funding. Uh, but what, what the real reality is with federal funds is that everything is siloed. So if, if Connie's going after broadband funds, she goes here. If she's going after water funds, she goes here. If she's going after economic development funds, she goes here. And Tony's chart shows that in real time. But this is one of those truly unique programs that would allow you to use funds across different needs. And, and it would be based on what communities need. So it's not the federal government saying, here, you need broadband go and do this, or you need water access, go and do this. It's saying, what are your needs? And use this flexible funding to, to focus on those areas that your community needs the most. And so it's a really unique program in that flexibility, especially within USDA where everything is siloed based on program area. And it truly, the intent is to be, a, be able to accelerate all those other programs and opportunities based on the needs of local communities. Thank you guys so much. You know, I have to say, I love being a moderator when I don't really even need to be a moderator. You guys, I really took care of that so beautifully. And all of your comments were were, were perfect and just really, really, really helpful. Um, 
I have a couple of conver I have a couple of questions for you all, and there are some convert there are some questions that are are popping up in the chat, and we have about thirty minutes to do that. So I think we're going to just get get right to it, right? So the first question, I, I think everybody has sort of understood from you all the the potential here, which is which is great. The first question that I want to ask you, which is also coming up in the the Q and A, is people are asking. Um, how do we get this over the finish line, right? What What is the, the, the best role that on the ground, particularly on the ground community development organizations can play to advocate for adoption? And I actually wanna add a second part in there. Um, Tony, I know you referenced the, and Nathan, you did as well, you referenced that there's the possibility of authorization via the 23 Farm Bill. I'm thinking, oh my God, it is March 9th, 2022, and we gotta go, right? Like, so. How do we do this sooner than that? Because, you know, to your point, Connie, us at the JTF, and I know, all, you know, all my team, we're all watching this and participating in this today. We're just being overrun with requests to help people hire grant writers and figure out what to do. And, you know, the, 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 the emails and the requests are coming at all hours of the day, right? So it's not going to be sustainable for our local communities. So what can, what can community advocates do to make sure this gets over the finish line? And any chance of us getting this earlier than 2023, which seems like a long way off. I'll open that up. Go ahead. Go, Nathan. So I, I'm sure Tony's got something to add to this. So there's there's really potentially two main, main opportunities. One is if and when the Build Back Better conversations get reinvigorated. And this past week, we've for the first time in months seen a little bit of chatter on that. Uh, you know, obviously, Senator Manchin uh, plays a big role in those conversations, and uh, Senate Majority Leader Schumer just started to kind of talk about what what those provisions could potentially look like. Uh, so, one is to be really active in those conversations once they start to bubble up, to be talking to your members of Congress, to your senators about why this is important and why they should be uh, really focused on this. Now, I'll tell you, the Build Back Better is a strictly partisan issue at this point in time. I don't view the Rural Partnerships Program as a partisan issue at all. I view it as a, as a great bipartisan opportunity for folks to be talking about it. But if we're talking about actual avenues to get something passed, that's the first avenue is the Build Back Better, whatever that next version of Build Back Better might be. Um, so folks like Senator Manchin, Senator Kelly, uh, and others are going to be a, a, a big part of, of those discussions. The second one is the Farm Bill. Those conversations are already starting to happen. So the uh, Undersecretary uh, Torres Small, who is the Rural Development Undersecretary, was on the Hill just yesterday for the first hearing to start this process. And so it's going to be really critical if you have a member of Congress on the House or Senate Agriculture Committees to be on their doorstep talking about this program as a priority for you and for your communities. Uh, that process starts now and will go all the way through completion in 2023. And that's part of the reason this webinar is so important, so that you're thinking about this and, and starting to understand it a little bit better. But it's a process that's going to be continued throughout the next year and a half for the Farm Bill. And so, you know, we got to start banging the drum now and continue that banging all the way through the end, the end goal. One, 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 real short, Tony? one real short addendum to what uh, Nathan just so uh nicely laid out, which is exactly the opportunities. Don't expect your congressional member as the as whatever happens um, from the fragments of the Build Back Better Act and that conversation starts to percolate as Nathan said right now. Don't presume that your congressional member knows about the Rural Partnership Program or is familiar with it. Um, there's an education process here. There was a lot of different things in the Build Back Better Act and um, and Nathan even started us off with saying, you know, we tended to not have a real organized, consistent voice just on equitable rural development on a regular basis. So just educating your congressional delegation about what your challenges are and actually trying to access federal funds and why this would enable you to, to do something different, the flexibility and the capacity that it would enable, I think it, it, it would just be, it would just be a great for a great step for anybody uh, to take. Well, Tony, on that, on that um, point there, I mean, that, that's one of the reasons why the JTF and our, our the NET uh, collaborative national economic transition initiative that we've been working with, um, why, why we're so, so interested in this. There's, um, there's, 
this this problem really affects the the problem of of transitioning coal com, coal communities is really one that is rural, right? And so our grantees in transitioning energy communities, at least with respect to oil, I think it's slightly different with, or excuse me, at least with respect to coal, it's slightly different with oil and gas, but are a subset of this group. And, and, and traditionally, these groups have not really been engaged with um, a lot of the, the, the federal policy, rural economic development conversations, which is one of the things that we're, we're trying to change here, right? So again, glad you're, you know, glad you're, you're mentioning that. Um, Connie, any comments from you on that question before we, we move on to the other one? I, I would say, you know, this all starts local. So to Tony's point, if you get off of this webinar and you call your local jurisdictions and you let them know about the program and you urge them to make one phone call and we start building from the top down so everyone understands um, why flexible funding in rural is important and why not just to come up with one little more fix. Um, and, that would just be helpful. Just, you know, start with your local, it will eventually it will get to a mansion, but, but this is going to be a long time. I mean, it's there, it's not going to be tomorrow. We might get lucky. Who knows? We might get lucky and get something this year, but I think we need to build a better case for less silos in the farm bill as well. So, so I'm sorry, 2023 is around the corner. <laughs> So we've got to we've got to stay um, we've got to not pretend that's too long here. So great, great, Connie. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, just following up on some of these questions about about getting this bill passed, um, there is I want to ask. Um, there's one follow up question. This is directed to you, Nathan. And so the question is: um, Are you saying that there is no chance for the rural partnership program before the next farm bill? No chance of it being passed as an independent piece of legislation. You have particular comments on that? So I'm not saying that there's no chance of it being passed before the farm bill because I think there's a great chance as these conversations around what whatever comes out of the Build Back Better package, there's a, a huge chance it was already in that package. It can be framed in this. Uh, you know, conversation around uh, climate and around transitioning communities in particular. Uh, and so, no, I please don't don't come away from this conversation thinking that's not a possibility. That is absolutely the single biggest and, and quickest opportunity for this. As far as a standalone, because of the way that authorizations work, uh, it can't happen as a standalone. It has to happen as part of the farm bill process. The farm bill is the single authorizing legislation for Department of Agriculture programs. And so that's part of the nature of why this is difficult is it happens every five years and it's this gigantic piece of legislation that has every interest and advocacy group as a part of it. And so that again is why, as Connie said, we've got to start the conversations now and keep them up throughout the process. But no, we need to start and push now uh, for whenever those Build Back Better conversations start to evolve to make sure this is a priority. Great. So there's a question in the chat um, that is about um, materials, right? Any materials that, that we could use to assist with the advocacy? And the answer is yes. Um, um, Aran and Nathan's group and Connie and Tony have all put together great materials. Um, the JTF team will send those around afterward to make sure that anyone who is interested has those. Um, we have another question here, two more actually I wanna raise on, on implementation. Um, there's a question about um, why did RPP get whittled down from 5 billion to 4 billion to 1 billion? And of course, I'm sure there's a fantastic story there. If, if you all maybe could shed a little bit of light on that, that would be, that'd be helpful. Uh, Nathan, you want, well, I, I mean, I think part of it is, um, always trade-offs when it comes to be putting together a big package like Build Back Better to, to, together. I will say that the original proposal at 5 billion, you know, it was in the house version at 4 billion. So there was not much loss. I think there was still a lot of alignment uh, in the original proposal. Um, I think there is a recognition that it's, it needs significant investment uh, because you do want these to be multi-year grants and you don't want them to be one million dollar grants like the, we want you want to provide a substantial on-ramp for communities to have capacity at a consistent level that then they can actually put together maybe some pieces from from other parts of the federal constellation um, to package them together in the way that, that, that Connie and Nathan were talking about now from the four to the one was when 
Senators Manchin and Cinema basically said, look, you know, 2.9 trillion, 3 trillion is too high. We can't go for that package. We need to go, uh, you know, we're looking for something, you know, more in the realm of 1.5 to 1.9. Um, that's where uh, many different programs actually came under pressure. Actually, I think from our perspective, we were still very excited that the RPP stayed in and it did have a few champions to make sure it stayed in and it stayed in and at a significant enough level for there to truly be proof of concept. And I, I think the thinking there was, let's make sure it happens. Um, we give it some runway and then we do know there's a farm bill coming up to Nathan's point in 2023. So we'll have something to work on and some experience, some proof of concept, so to speak, that then we could look at a larger authorization uh, coming down the pike. I don't know, Nathan, if you wanna add anything to that. Uh, just a couple of things. Number one, you know, this is part of the legislative process. Uh, you know, things get whittled down, priorities are, are swapped and, and talked through. Uh, and I wanna say, you know, I'm a big believer in celebrating even the smallest of wins. And this was a big win to make sure that that RPP stayed within that framework. They cut a lot of things out and a lot of things back. And so, you know, the conversation was always, well, what is what is the least amount that would actually be, you know, effective for a program like this? And you never want to be in that position of a conversation. But I will say, and Michaela Bodie's, I know on this call, Michaela, who is on the staff of the Senate Agriculture Committee, and certainly her boss, Senator Stabenow, uh, were big proponents of this program and did yeoman's work in making sure that this stayed in as a priority as those cuts were being made. So while 1 billion is certainly not 5 billion, uh, to me, it was still a really big win to have it in, uh, even at that level. And the hope is that not only do we get it into whatever the Build Back Better opportunity is, but then that becomes a pilot and a success story so the Farm Bill can even be a larger authorization. Great. Thank you guys. Thank you all so much. So I've got a few more questions um, just related to getting this over the finish line. And then I would love to talk a little bit about design and then maybe a little bit about impact and evaluation and equity. Um, so the first question um, is really about our, from our friends in, in West Virginia. We've got the JTF has a lot of grantees in West Virginia. There's a lot of really amazing organizations doing really innovative community economic development work. Um, I sort of a two part question for you. Um, what, what is your latest take on Senator Manchin and, and his particular support of the RPP? Um, and then any thoughts on, again, how West Virginia community and workforce groups can really um, you know, enter into this, both with Senator Manchin and actually with Senator Capito? So I would say Senator Manchin, you know, has been responsive uh, and, and interest in this. Certainly, this could be a great win and opportunity for West Virginia communities. You know, I think part of that with Senator Manchin is the focus on, on making cuts and what are those cuts that have to be made. I know he came out earlier this week and talked about uh, the need to balance some of these funds to, you know, pay down the debt uh, to make sure that we're addressing inflationary uh, items and then to focus on climate related things. And to me, this certainly has a climate focus to it, especially if we're talking about transitioning communities in particular, there's a specific need for this kind of capacity building. And so I think there's a real opportunity to make sure we're engaging with, with his office. I will tell you that he's probably been the busiest office of any in the Senate, uh, as far as people reaching out because of his importance and the role that he's been playing. But the more voices we can get, especially from West Virginia to his office to talk about the priorities for this, the better. Uh, it doesn't mean that we're going to get him to be the end all be all champion, but if, if he can be a champion among many, that would be a big deal. Great. Tony, any thoughts, additional thoughts on that question? No, I think that's, a, I think that I don't have much to add there. I think that's exactly right. And I think that there's in, in principle support, both for the concept and for the focus on rural as well. Great. Cool. All right. So a couple of, I think, sort of maybe more, more rapid fire um, for rapid fire questions for you all. Um, there is a question in the chat Connie, over what. Yes. Connie wanted, I think Connie wanted to add something. Oh, I'm sorry, Connie. I didn't see. Please go ahead. Sorry about oh, that. You know, I, I just want to say um, we have started to have conversations with our members about 
Like why existing funding isn't working? So, you know, when, when we've brought them into community problems, we've said to them, okay, you, pre you pretend and try to find the funding for this. And ultimately, when their offices start trying to navigate it too, they, that's when the, the light bulb comes off, when they get involved and engaged and they go, oh no, we can't even find what's going on. So I think that that, you know, like if, you can, if we can figure out how to take our members on the journey with us as communities, um, we've made them say, okay, you go figure out what the best silo is for this. And when they start interviewing people, they go, oh, that silo is not going to work for you. Oh, now I understand what you're talking about. So if you have that opportunity and have that relationship, try to bring your office into your, into your community development game more. Cool. Thanks. Sorry, th Nathan. Thank you for that. Sorry about that, Connie. I think I'm man managing too many things here. Okay. So back to the questions at hand. Over what period would the one billion need to be spent? That's our first rapid fire question. That's a that would be over five billion uh, five five year period. Great. Okay. Cool. This I think is a tough one, um, but I think that that more and more questions like this will come up as people start digging into this. Any speculation or thoughts on what percent or what maybe a uh, 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 portion of the RPP might be specifically designated for transitioning energy communities or coal communities in particular? And you know that is a question in the chat, and I, I think it's a I think it's an important one. Just you know, just given what we're seeing at EDA right now, right? I mean, EDA yeah. three billion dollars, three hundred million set aside just for coal communities, recognizing that this is a special problem and it's part of what the administration wants to address. So thoughts on that one. So there's no specific uh, set aside for coal or anything like that, and this was conceived as a competitive uh, grants, a competitive grant program. Having said that, um, there would be apportionments. The way it was conceived, there would be apportionments by state, based on both rurality, a, a definition that the secretary would would have to come up with on rural rurality, as well as um, income level, income status. Uh, and um, I think the, the other thing that I would say to that is I think in, in a design phase, when you're actually operationalizing the principles of the program, I think there will be questions that have to be answered as to uh, how to measure sort of the vulnerability of a community and how that fits into, because the, the key principle here is to be able to get investment to those communities that um, are particularly vulnerable and, and or in a particular place as it relates to distress. And so I think there would have to be further work to be done in the design of, of implementing the program. It's probably more of an implementation question than not. Um, and while there might not be something specific for uh, like a specific set a set amount of funds for particular coal communities. I think some of the elements of program design would ensure that they're meeting the needs and, and trying to make sure that there's a targeting towards those types of communities. So on the on you know since we're since we're delving into to program design, um, I think that that's another. Um, uh, sort of uh, message that we've been, I know that we've been um, hearing a lot at the JTF, but for those people who, you know, do know about the RPP, there's this idea that it's like it's designed and it's done. And I think that that if you're hearing anything from the speakers, that is not the case. You know, there is still a lot of room to design this, right? Um, so my question for you all is, you know, you're starting to get questions from, you know, again, maybe people that you don't always work with, energy transition communities and whatnot. What is the plan and what are you all thinking about to reach out to some of those different stakeholders and get more input in the design phase between now and, you know, Connie, I hear your point, 2023 Farm Bill, although I still feel like we want it tomorrow. <laughs> so thoughts on design and, and how people can engage and, and even maybe what the JTF might be able to do to, to sort of pull in our, our network of folks. So I, I would love Tony and, and Connie's thoughts on this as well. To me, there's a couple pieces of this. Number one, I think RN wants to have more of these conversations and make it more engaging so that we are hearing directly from communities on, on what those needs are. I think, you know, to Tony's point earlier, 
you know, the design is this is, is to meet community needs and, and meet communities where they are. And so that may look and feel differently in different states, right? In Maine, you may be focused on timber industry. In West Virginia or Kentucky, it may be coal. In the Southwest, it may be water issues. Uh, and so, you know, that's the both the, the beauty of it, but also the engagement piece is going to be really critical. Our RAN will certainly be engaging with the agency, but we also would be encouraging the agency to make sure they're engaging with communities in every state as a part of this process as well. Uh, the flexibility is really important and key, but it also needs to make sure that flexibility benefits the communities and the needs of those communities. I think Nathan said something really important there, and that is, you know, the program's key principle is to meet communities where they're at. And so the important thing is we have to know where communities are at to be able to do that. And I think we're going to continue to push, you know, if this were to, to be passed and the design, you know, then fell to USDA, we will continue to push USDA staff on really consulting deeply to ensure that whatever kind of design is put together is going to, uh, is going to meet the needs of, uh, of communities in that particular way. Great, Connie, any additional thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah, I would, yeah, I would just say, you know, as a, a, you know, I, whenever I go to USD, I hear I come from the land of fruits and nuts, right? Like, you, you know, <laughs> why are you even engaged in this conversation or whatever? And so I really hear that, like, I don't want somebody else, you know, telling my region how to do this. I mean, that's the whole purpose of this is so that your region has a voice in how um, it's going to develop in, in the community. So, um, whatever, you know, we need to do a lot more of this, but then we need to also hear from you all. So we make sure that whatever design, this is the one that works for folks. Um, and, and so, um, you know, let's figure out, how, let's, help, let's engage Heidi and figure out how to best do that so that we don't make the mistake that so many other programs that are silos make. Yeah. I yeah. So, well, go ahead. Go ahead, Tony. No, no, please go ahead. I was go just going to say, ahead. I think it, I think it will require, you know, different skills and competencies as well at USDA and and within the federal architecture. Like it's, it's going to be, it's not just getting transactions out the door. It's not just getting money out the door. It is really going to be a partner, as Connie mentioned, as Connie described it earlier, and it's going to require a lot of listening, and it's going to require um, a lot of identification of. Like where do needs match with where resources are, um, and I think that's different. And I think that's I think it's a good. I mean, that's why I think you know when Nathan says this could be transformative, it's going to require transformation on the federal side as well. Um, can I can I just give? I know we're running out of time, but can I just give a quick example? Like, I, you know, I'm in an energy transition community, so we're we are going to have leases given off our coast for wind, right? Well we tried to get federal funding this year for our park development, right? So this is the port that's going to be able to get out to the wind. The money for the port development was denied, but the leases are happening, right? So once, you know, this is the kind of problem we're trying to stop, right? You know, we're trying to stop the federal government moving forward with its agenda and leaving the community behind because we didn't fit into that silo program, right? So if we had this ability to say to the feds, oh, no, no, we if you want to do your thing, you're going to do the, our thing for our community, too. And if we're going to talk about resilience or whatever, we're going to talk about resilience marching forward together. And we we're not going to argue or fight for the resources. They're going to be guaranteed as part of the vision, the bigger vision. So that's, you know, that that's the spirit in which I wake up every week <laughs> and meet with these guys um, and what I'm trying to do. So I don't end up in a situation where it's like, okay, how are we going to get our port developed, in, you know, when they're moving forward with their energy transition plan? Is our community going to get left out again, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I'm, I'm so excited about this program. I think that there's so much potential, and you know, just you know, hearing you all talk and just thinking about what we need to do. You know, these 
communities are so under resourced now you know what we found through through our work is there's just there's just a giant hole and there's just a lack of capacity and time for local leaders to do anything much less follow the federal policy process and figure out how they're supposed to engage and, and what's going on and what is the best thing for them to do right so you know for any philanthropists who are on the call and want to talk about how we can support and make sure that local leaders really have the capacity to inform this type of federal policy which is really going to do a lot to 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 um, to really benefit them, I, we'd love to talk with you because it's a it's a real big hole. Um, there's so many questions in the chat, which is great, and so many things that we can't get to. We will follow up with some of the things we promised, and maybe follow up with some of the answers. Um, just before we go, and we just have a, a couple of minutes, and, and Tony, you already alluded to this, but I just wanted to ask you because in in thinking about the program and in re reading about it and hearing you all speak today, I am just. Um, keenly aware and thinking about what it is going to take at USDA, the skills, the expertise to actually implement a program like this. You know, you're asking a federal agency to do work, not business as usual. It's a new model. It's a transformative model. And it's not the typical, hey, give the money to the states and the states are going to figure it out, right? Um, there's a lot of programs now where I, I think even agencies are struggling to try to ensure communities get you know, get dollars um, well now, let alone asking them to do it through, you know, just again, a really, really new model. I'm wondering if you guys could say a few words on that um, and what maybe we need to be thinking with respect to, to USDA um, just going forward and what, you know, what, what they need to really be able to implement this. Thoughts on that? Well, I, I think you're exactly right. I mean, I do think it, uh, first off, I think it requires, and, and it, you did see um, a portion of the money being set aside actually for administrative purposes. I do think it requires people and it's going to require, um, uh, uh, it's going to require making sure that they have the resources for the people to do it. Um, but it is going to require sort of approaching it in a different way, even measuring you know, what the outcomes are, uh, I think this is a real opportunity to transform how we even think of what success is and how we measure what success is. Um, and I think that will, that will be challenging. I think at least right now at USDA under the leadership of the undersecretary, um, as Nathan mentioned and, and uh, deputy undersecretary, I think there's a real appetite but I do think it will require some change process internally and, and, um, and looking to build a, a different way and, and different infrastructure, even internal to the organization to be able to achieve this. Connie, your thoughts on that? Well, I'm, I'm an evaluator by nature and I, I don't like transactional evaluation. I like trans additional evaluate. You know, I wanna know I want to figure out matrix on how what we're doing on the ground resonates throughout the community, not we created 15 jobs. So, mm -hmm. you know, there are a group of us who are looking at those more transitional um, evaluation tools. Um, and I think, you know, as we tell the story better of our communities, we need to we need to be able to assure that there's community matrix. Like what is, what are the community expectations as well for why the community supports this, this kind of development or change? Um, so, you know, we, we talk about it often, like we have got to get away from the number of jobs, <laughs> or, you know, per dollar. We just have yeah. to. Yeah, there is a and great well, question in the Okay. Yeah, there's a great there's a great question in the chat just exact exactly this and I, I was hoping we could do a number of questions about it again I'm sorry we didn't have time maybe this is a whole other webinar because just thinking about um, how you measure how you evaluate you know um, we think again we, we work a lot at this at the, at the JTF and just really thinking about how you're truly truly building wealth and and advocating for transformational change and it's equitable through an equitable and inclusive processes right um, it's it's going beyond I think what you know Know, tr the traditional measures, and I know all of you have done a lot of thinking about that. So, um, you know, again, maybe another maybe another webinar on I and E. Um, Nathan, any final thoughts on, on USDA and just just the enormity of the challenge here? Yeah. So, going back to the last question, you know, to me, 
This is not an evolutionary approach. This is a revolutionary approach for USDA. And I go back, I coach the 12 year old basketball team. And the most important piece to that is repetition, 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 repetition. And for an agency like USDA or any other federal agency, it's about repetition. What do they know? What have they done? What do they continue to do? And so this program will be long-term in nature. It'll be multi-year funding, which is different than what USDA is used to. Used to, you get you know, a water grant one time every 10 years, or you get a broadband grant one every 25 years. This is something that is going to be long-term in nature, multi-year, and a little bit different. And so it's about creating repetitions for the agency and thinking about how they actually fund programs and operationalize programs. Cool. Great. Great. Well, we are unfortunately at time. I know we could keep talking. Connie, Nathan, and Tony, thank you guys so much for your amazing work in this area. And thank you for joining us today. Um, we will follow up um, to those of you on this call with some of the things that we, we referenced and um, maybe look for another webinar on this as we dig in more about what this means for equity and how we can, Tony, maybe get the government to start thinking about goals and metrics a little bit more so that the right people, <laughs> the right people can be helped. <laughs> cool, everybody. That's, well, thank a, you that's all. more than a webinar, but I'm I know. way up for it. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was like, yeah, as I was saying that, I'm like, that's like the whole like, you know, like, like 10 year process. So but we'll work on it. We'll work on it. So thank you all. And those of you, thank you guys for joining us, everyone. Have a great thank day you. and uh, take good care. Bye. Thanks.